Hello and welcome. My name is Mark Blatstein, the founder of Physician Pre-Sentence Report Service. Today's YouTube and a podcast is going to be on you've been through, you've been indicted, you've gone through the fear of this surreal event, you and your family, possibly some fear and being paralyzed, if you will. You've been to the sentencing hearing, and if everything we reviewed, you, you've done, you've been, you've had a comprehensive pre-sentence report, and <clears throat> you're going to be prepared now by the end of this YouTube as to how you can begin to essentially earn your way home, because with the first step back. In addition to be able to, to have good time, which is 15% of your time, as long as you don't get in trouble, towards good time credits, you can also earn earn time credits, which is the work, work you can do through the First Step Back programs. And <clears throat> how this is done is through stakeholders. Some of you who have listened into my YouTubes in the past have heard me use this term, this term, and to others, this will be new. But stakeholders are those who are responsible for you after you have either gone through trial and have a guilty verdict or you have pled guilty. And as the judge sentences you, you are then transitioned over into the Federal Bureau of Prisons. And they are responsible for reducing what they call your criminogenic needs, which you have now as a guilty person or as a justice impacted person. And as I have shared with all of you in the past, while I have my medical license, I too, about 20 years ago, was indicted of a federal crime, pled guilty. And I'm grateful that I had those among my peers and colleagues that supported me where in 2010, my license was reinstated, but I digress. So whether you were remanded or you surrendered to a federal prison, chances are you were either at a low or minimum category. And being designated as such, they have certain characteristics and one of the stakeholders you've never met was responsible for placing you. And these are BOP administrative personnel in Grand Prairie, Texas. And although you've never met them, they have scoured your pre-sentence report from it's beginning to its end completely. But if you've done it and you have a comprehensive pre-sentence report, it's now known as the Inmates Bible. And it includes all of the following. So in addition to if you have a somewhat detailed medical history, all of that information, all of your prescriptions, medical devices, hit, all of your surgical procedures you've had done in the past, if, you, if you're expecting that potentially have a problem, all of your doctor's contact information, their records, their notes, their treatment plans, all of that, all the prescriptions are, are in this record. And they have been presented at the level of the pre-sentence at the pre-sentence interview, all of your surgeries, dental information, if there's any been psychologist, psychiatrist, anything in your background is all there, all your personal information regarding, I'm, I'm sure your financial information is there, all of your um, highest level of education, military service, social security card, driver's license, all of that. In addition, I'm going to assume I don't like to, but I assume that you have 
also written your personal narrative, which is your story, because to date, the Department of Justice has their personal, their narrative of you or their story of you, which is your criminal history. That's your indictment that's been released to the press. And everyone's read it, your colleagues, friends, family, and your judge. But your personal narrative is your story from childhood, childhood until now, which has given your version of events but it also includes your accepting responsibility, remorse, and your acknowledgement of the pain you inflicted upon your victims. It also includes your release plan, which your judge is going to ask you about at sentencing because the judge does not want to see you back in their courtroom. It's going to include parts of your character letters that have come in as you have requested. And it's also going to include some of the Spark 13 assessment questions, which are questions regarding the First Step Act program that you want to participate in. And all of that has been woven into one document that your attorney has shared with the probation officer before your interview, several weeks before the interview, so that you don't have to, and your probation officer doesn't spend all of their time writing and typing at the time of your interview, so they can get spend their time getting to know you as a person, which is probably best. So that during their interview time, they can get to know you as a person. And hopefully that time turns out to be fruitful because at the end of the interview, they will be writing your pre-sentence report and passing on a sentencing recommendation with a placement recommendation to the judge before your sentencing hearing. And so it's in your interest to be able to have all this information provided to the probation officer long before they ever meet you, because it's also going to be read by another stakeholder, and that's going to be, once you get into the Federal Bureau of Prisons, well, that will be your case management, the case management officer, as well as their the unit team. In addition, you should also know your pattern score. And your pattern score is going to be what allows you to participate in taking the first step back programs that allow you to earn earn time credits. And so it's important for you to, to know what goes into the pattern score begin before rather you begin to write your narrative letter, especially your release plan, because there are parts of it that you may want to introduce into your uh re-entry letter and so let's look and see what goes into the pattern score and i'm going to try here and see if i can share this correctly is it going to work i think so Hopefully. And... Okay, so here we're on my website. And the heading we're going to is the first heading here, pre-sentence interview. And I'm going to draw down. And so I'm going to cover two things here. The first thing is that we're going to go into, and I'll show you a sample pattern score. These are hardcore, hard-coded. They allow you to earn time credits. And initially, you're going to start off with 10 credits per month. And you can work your way up to 15. Now, there's been back and forth between the Bureau of Prisons 
and activists that think that you should be able to be earning by your second assessment 15 and the Bureau of Prisons is, you know, not really allowing that, but that's a little bit beyond what I'm able to offer you. So I'm going to open this up here. And here is the male pattern score. So it's hard coded, meaning that it's current age. So the older you are, unfortunately, your score is lowest, which is where you want it to be. If it's a child, you know, pornography type thing, then you may have a problem. It's a if you violent offense pattern, well, here you're not going to, there's a special violent uh category. It's another one of these charts. Um it may be an issue, but for as far as offense, you're not haven't been in a system for before, so it doesn't really apply. Criminal history, if you haven't been within a system, it may not apply. History of escapes it may not apply. History of violence, there's another uh, one of these scoring sheets for violence. You need to cross-reference with that. Education score, again, if the higher your education, higher your education, the lower the number. Drug programs, you're not in the system, so it doesn't really apply. And then if you have incident reports, but again, you're not in the system, it doesn't apply. A lot of this will begin to apply as you're after you're in the prison system and they have uh, subsequent assessments. Financial responsibility program. You do not want to uh, refuse because if you refuse, it will negatively impact your ability to participate. Programs completed. You've just entered, you know, this is for your first assessment. So it, it doesn't, there, it won't give you any uh, programs because you haven't been there before. Work programs, the same thing. But the lower the number, the better you are. So even though you have it just entered the system, it was zero, okay? But if once you're there, if you have one program, it'll be a negative number. Again, the lower the number, the better. The next thing, which is going to be for a topic that I will cover momentarily, is going to regard documenting everything. And although I'm jumping ahead, part of what I'm going to talk about is going to be keeping a logbook, keeping a journal, um, just try and remember this conversation for them for, for at that point in time, if I can remember to bring this up. But suffice it to say, and the my example is going to be, we all carry automobile insurance, car insurance, house insurance. We don't really, you, know, you don't need it until you do. And here, you want to document every case, every class you take for earned time credits. When you go in, you want to, you know, write about it. Uh, day, date, the date you take it, the day you take it, the course, who is the teacher and what they talked about. Every day you take each class. And it's important that you do all of that as well as everything else you do that's, that's has, it's constructive during your day while you're in prison. Why is that? Because this person, when you read this particular case, let me try and open this up here. And you'll see that this case, when it opens up, it's an example of why you need to document your first step back cases because the petitioner thought he owned 365 days of credits, but they only gave them 75 days. And this is the whole case. A, I'm not going to read the whole thing to you, but you can go to my website, click a website, click on it and look it up. But the reason for this is that you want to document everything that you do, because if in fact they say that you earned, you know, 200 days of first step back credits and you have 365, you can go in with it clearly documented and you have something to say. That's the main reason why I brought this up. And so let me stop that share and let's see if I can do that. I think I can. And so continuing, 
So the the first the, the pattern score is is important because you'll be able to understand, you know, how you got to that medium, or excuse me, low or minimum, and why it's important to go and do all that documentation. So now we're gonna, I'm gonna switch and get into the nitty gritty. So you enter prison and you're going to meet with your case manager. And when you meet with your case manager, you're going to go ahead and you're re going to request to take the, the assessment for that first step back to be able to participate in the programs. And there are several different assessments. There's a questionnaire that you can go to on my website that has a series of questions that they will have, they will, I think it'll be on the internet system. They may ask, they may give it to you when you first surrender a part of it. And part of it may be in person with your uh, case manager. At the same time, they will also do the assessment, that pattern score that I just finished showing you. But either way, you should know that most of you, if not all of you, will be at a low or minimum score. And so once they you're there, they're going to go, your case manager, at the earliest possible convenience to them, you should ask because you should let them know that you understand that there are assessments and there are programs there and they could help you with, you know, understand and help you because you have criminogenic tendencies and you read about that online. Now they may say, okay, and they may give you a program. You could be a stockbroker, um, have a career as a public official. Um, and the program they may give you to, when you first get there is either to walk around the track, how to sew your underwear, or how to balance a checkbook. It doesn't matter what the program is. Take it and say thank you. That's it. Because they are just the responsible for this, giving you a program to date to take because their job is to, to watch and see if you can have, watch you have incremental improvements, improvements in reducing your criminogenic need. And the criminogenic need, although you may not think you have any, and your family may not think you have any, and I don't think you have any, but because you pled guilty and you're in prison, they think you have criminogenic needs and they need to see incremental improvements as you progress through these programs. Because if they don't, then they're going to constantly hold you back from early release of any kind. And so as you go to these programs, you cannot be late for any of them if you have a medical if if you have a if you're on some sort of sick call and you go to medical and nobody shows you just can't pick up and walk out and go to commissary or go to meet somebody you have to stay there if you have somewhere that else you need to go ask permission to leave this is not freedom you, you have to ask permission for everything that you do. And it may seem like parental supervision, possibly, but this is a brand new world with, and it's their rules and their sandbox, as I like to say. So we're now playing in someone else's sandbox. Once you finish that program every day, go back to your bunk, go to the library, and write down the, the day you took it, you took that class, the date that it's on, the teacher's name, what they taught you, and what you learned. And, and something nice about the professor or the teacher that taught it, 
in something, anything that you could take from that class that you could use and do that every day that you do that, that you took that class. And I say that because let's say six months from now, what happens if a year from now, the let I'm rec I'm recording this. It's April eighteenth, twenty twenty three. So let's say in March of twenty twenty four, you're going into the your case manager, and they tell you that well we have a problem because in April eighteenth of twenty twenty three, you missed your class, and we have here that you never you 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 never went there and so all those credits that you went that you all those class other classes you went to i don't know if this can happen this way but let's just say it, it does the the main point is they have that you didn't go and so you're done you can't get credit for anything going forward or if they found if they talk to you on april uh 30th and they said i'm sorry they call you in and they said april 18th we saw that you didn't show up you can say well here is my booklet and i was there this is the day it was a sunny day it was a wednesday this is the teacher's name this is what they taught this is what i learned and see and so this is your insurance policy. You know, it's kind of like health insurance. I said it already. You, you buy health insurance, car insurance, life insurance. You hope you don't need it. And you're glad if you do. You know, if you get in a car accident, you're glad to have the insurance. If your house has a fire, et cetera. And so that's where I'm trying to, you know, explain that everything needs to be documented. <clears throat> that's why they're called earn time credits. And so over time, there's probably not going to be a lot of persons, inmates going to meet with their case managers that are going to be showing, you don't need to show their, your booklet every time. Just take a cop, go to the copy machine. Hopefully there is one. If there isn't, get a piece of paper, write it out longhand and hand it to your case manager. Don't hand them the booklet. That's yours. But who's going to take the time to do that? And so every time you go to the meeting with your case manager, you don't give them everything that's in the booklet, only what transpired from the previous visit. So that, you know, you're able to show that shows your incremental improvements. I didn't think of this doing it this way because when I was in, federal prison in 2006 ish this didn't exist but unless you can figure a better way of doing this this is the only way i know of proving that you're going out of your way of showing incremental improvements to the staff to the case managers and over time your case manager is going to believe that this, you're actually doing a good job. So to underline that, you may or may not know what you want to do when you are released. You may have actually no idea or not even bothered to think about it. I'm hoping that whoever prepped you before your pre-sentence interview, you've given thought to that because... If you are someone who I work with you, then you know me personally, that what drove me to even tr transition from patient care to this was that I was unprepared at every level. And being prepared means that it, it's early in the process, but being prepared before your pre-sentence interview forced you to kind of take a look at it. And while it is premature at that point in time, the judge definitely wanted to know what your plan was not to show up back in their courtroom for sure. And so at this point, your, your pre-sentence 
report and narrative had to include parts of a release plan, which your case manager has read. And if not, it's still not too late to start preparing your release plan. And if you haven't presented to the BOP yet, you can you can begin it at home. If you're in prison, you can begin it there. And there are things you can begin to write to prepare your release plan when you're in prison. <clears throat> but books, start reading if you have... I, if you have no idea what you want to do and you're in prison, there are biographies. You could start reading biographies of famous people, art, art, art history, science, painting, life skills. Um, just pick categories and begin to read. Uh, there may be books on that in the library. And in the meantime, Paperbacks from Amazon are the simplest to get through. If you were prepared before you entered prison, then you have friends and family with a preset schedule that every three weeks are mailing a couple books to you so that you can begin to read on your own because no one's going to pay you when you get out of prison to watch television or to play basketball, baseball, or weightlift. I'm not saying not to walk the track a lot and not to play sports, but you need begin to you need to begin to acclimate yourself academically, or in some matter, even if you want to open a pizza pie shop, to begin to prepare for what's on the outside. And so, as you begin to read books, begin to do the same thing, documenting them every day when you're done writing about the class. Now read a couple chapters in the book, day, day, time, author, about what you read. And if there's something interesting there, write it. And even if there's not, still document what you read and what chapter you're on, <clears throat> because there's something for interest for everyone out there in the literary world. If you're still home, you can go to my website, one of the chapters, I forget, one of the pages at the very bottom, I've got at least 20 some odd books, as well as categories, business, I think science, life skills, art, I forget already. But they're there. And so you want to be so that as you begin to do all this reading and writing, and just think about it, Again, this is April 18th, 2023. And let's say you're, you're in prison and you're writing and you're going now into your case manager and it is, I don't know, March 2024. All of a sudden, your reentry plan shows a lot of depth about all of the reading and writing that you're doing. And maybe you're beginning to have ideas about what you want to do when you're out. And so all of this depth is, believe me, not many other individuals are going to be reading and writing and delivering this amount of content to their case managers. And so this is very important. Should you have been a very successful person on the outside? Well, you have lots of experience. And guess what? You can, if you have a sentence that's, you know, 27, 37 months in there somewhere, think about creating a course, planning a curriculum before you go into prison. It's not to say you're also going to take first step back programs and prepare for that. It's not to say you're, you know, if you're already, you know, if you if you're already educated and have experience, you're probably a reader already but share your experience with those around you i mean there's life skills there's investment you can you can teach there's whatever your whatever your knowledge base is begin thinking about planning a, cur a curriculum that would be interested to those so that they could go ahead and um you know they could learn from your experience. 
then you could run those I, once you've organized that into some sort of curriculum for other persons that could meet twice a week, let's so say for th several months, meet with your case manager, show them what you have. And if they're happy, they can show that to their supervisors. And guess what? They may give you the okay, and then your case manager can take credit for it. So again, it goes back to, I guess it's Covey, Covey that said that, you know, you help people get what they want, you they'll help you get what you want, so to speak. But it's something else you can do for you. Next is why you're doing all of this. If you have any conversations with staff, including the conversations with your case managers, anything that you have, no matter how innocent, should also go into your journal. Because even if it's something where they, you know, they ask you to do something for them or do something for yourself or however nuanced that conversation would, would be, log it. Because you never can tell whether months later someone's going to come back and ask you what happened or did you do that? You just you just don't want to be on the receiving end of that conversation. <clears throat> the Second Chance Act is another thing that indirectly all of this will help you with. Second Chance Act has several parts to it. First part, for those of you who don't have a college education, starting July 2023, there, if as long as you have your GED, there are college educations. No, there are colleges and universities where they're providing grants. There's Pell Grant that you can go onto my website and you could find them. Uh, there are college is where you can go onto my website and find them. I'll try and do that at the very end. So I don't take up too much time now. As well as you can go, as well as there is home detention. And again, the Second Chance Act, where the your case managers managers can proactively advocate for your behalf without you even asking. Next, should there be a financial responsibility? In other words, if you have a financial penalty with regards to your crime, you have the government, Congress, they need you to agree to participate in a financial responsibility program. And so if you have, you know, millions of dollars that you owe and you're going to be taking in maybe thousands of dollars a month, offer at the very first time that you have your meeting with your case manager, a couple hundred dollars a month. If you're only taking in, you know, a couple hundred dollars a month, maybe you offer $25 a month to $75 a quarter, or maybe $25 a quarter, depending how little money you have, but offer something. Also, please do not keep thousands of dollars in your account, tens of thousands of dollars in your account. That's like a big red flag because the Department of Justice really wants to swoop in and confiscate for people that have lots of money in restitution and are not paying a thing and keep, you know, a hundred thousand dollars, ten thousand dollars in their you know, where their commissary accounts are acting as their bank account, they feel that certain persons are using that to escape uh the arm of the law if you will regarding restitution you don't want to be put into that category if you do not have 
a release plan and you go through your entire prison sentence without a release plan, I guess my question is, why should your case manager recommend you to a halfway house? They're really not going to. Because the reentry residential reentry managers who manage halfway houses depend on case managers to recommend persons, male or female, to halfway houses. And part of the recommendation is on their how they spent their time in prison. And if there's not a reentry plan in there in your file, then the reentry manager is not going to go ahead and have any have much to read other than that you didn't all you did was spend your time watching television and eating and sleeping and playing sports. And so you know, they have residential reentry managers have a limited number of bed space. In other words, there is many more persons nationwide looking to get into halfway houses than there is bed space to accommodate them. So how can you stand out to residential reentry managers, whether you're going into the halfway house or to home confinement? because your residential reentry managers still supervise you when you're on home confinement. Once you transition from home confinement to supervised release, then it goes to probation officers. But while you're still on home confinement, that's still under the auspices of the residential reentry manager. And you know they need you know they want to look good too. They don't want to have trouble from anyone under their purview. And so they depend on that recommendation from case managers. And so in order to put your best foot forward, it's having a good release or reentry plan, plus, you know, a very good narrative if you've done that. And the people who go to or who work for halfway houses who work for um you know bureau of corrections work for the jails uh prisons county jails they all listen to the same fm radio station or am it's an am radio station w i i f m did you ever hear of it it's a um very popular radio station What's in it for me? They all, everything they do, they still want to do because even if it's recommending you to a halfway house, the, they're going to recommend you because you made them look good to their supervisors. Because if you, they recommend you to a halfway house and you escape the halfway house or you do get, do something wrong and get sent back to prison you look bad at the ha the case manager looks bad and the residential reentry manager looks bad too for choosing you. Lastly, you always want to err on the side of caution, meaning that let's say you made it to halfway house or you're on home confinement and there's something that you want to do. You're on home confinement and you, you need to do an errand or you're in a halfway house and you need to go somewhere, or you need to do something, whatever it is you feel you want to do. And even if you're on supervised release and you're waiting to hear back from the either the staff at the halfway house, the, the residential reentry manager, or the probation officer on supervised release, and you don't hear from them, believe me when I share with you that it's not okay. That doesn't mean it's okay. You need to get from them over the phone or in writing or both. It's okay. Or it's not okay. But get hearing a nothing where the, nobody gets back to you means nothing. You need to got, you either need to get a yes or a no. And if it's a yes, then see if you need to get it in writing. 
I hope you found this helpful. I appreciate you taking the time to listen and hope everybody has a good day. You will find my contact. In, oh, and if you choose to engage me, I'd be grateful. And as usual, I try and earn everyone's trust. Again, thanks for listening.